most challengingly of all. We're going to say to ourselves, well, what can you and I do about that? What can you do about it where you live in your parish and in your community? Hello and greetings to you all as you gather for your Youth 2000 workshop. This workshop on the social thought and teaching of the church. I'm grateful to Mario McAteer who has invited me to lead you in this exploration. Um, my name is Noel Trainer, and I'm Bishop of Down and Connor in the northeastern corner of Ireland. You'll see something of a reflection of it here on this beautiful painting, St. Patrick calling a young boy, Macnesi, to follow him. Uh, that's up in, in Glen Gareth uh, in North Antrim. Um, I'm glad to lead this workshop for a whole lot of reasons, uh, not just because I am a bishop and a pastor, but also because I happen to be also, among other things, a member and a vice president of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences, the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union member states. That's a group of bishops served by a secretariat where many young people work uh, in Brussels, which follows the policy making of the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European Council. That entity on behalf of the Church tries to help the institutions of the European Union, which represent us and our states, to develop policies in all kinds of areas that promote the common good, the good of every single individual and the good of society. At the same time, I'm also president of the um, Justice and Peace Commissions right throughout Europe, North, South, East and West. And that uh, Justice and Peace Europe uh, conference brings together women and men from all kinds of backgrounds and jobs, from architects to small business people, from judges to uh, lawyers and people who work in publication and in media, uh, people interested in the care of the seas, the care of the ocean, people interested in the environment, people interested in just tax policies and in an economy an economic system that promotes development, looks after the poor, as well as generating wealth, which can be shared and distributed among the citizens of our planet. We're going to look in this uh, workshop in four sessions at four different aspects of the social teaching of the Church. The first one, its origins in the Old and New Testament, in the Word of God. The second section, we're going to look at the development of Catholic social thinking and thought over the centuries. Then in the third part, we'll have a look at some of the key core themes so that you get a sense of some of the big issues that the, sort that the Church has engaged with on the basis of the Word of God, on the basis of our faith for the promotion and development of peoples. And finally, in the last section, most challengingly of all, we're going to say to ourselves, well, what can you and I do about that? What can you do about it where you live in your parish and in your community? So to move now into the first section, let me just refer you to two verses, two citations in the Bible that are key for understanding what the social teaching of the Church is about and where we might start in order to understand it. The first one is the final verse of the first book of Genesis, where after the scene of creation is depicted, the author of Genesis says, God looked at everything he had made and he saw that it was very good. Not just good, he saw that it was very good. How do you and I think about reality? It is God's creation. The second citation is from the first chapter, the opening chapter of the Gospel according to John. It's verse 14. The Word, that is the Word of God, was made flesh. And he lived among us. God walked this earth among people like you and me in flesh and bone in the person of Jesus Christ. These are two key anchor points, key anchor points, keystones for the development of the church's social thought and teaching. Firstly, that all of creation is good. It's called to be good in God's plan. Jesus walked the earth and he gave us a vision of life and of humanity to inspire us, over against which we can exercise our freedom to be agents 
of the development of that goodness that is God's intention and plan for life, for the cosmos, for human history and for the environment. Let's listen now to some other verses from the Old and New Testament. The story of creation, as recalled in the book of Genesis, reveals to us the plan of God for creation. In this account, we hear how God created day and night, the sky, land, sea and plants, the sun, the moon and the stars, the fish and the birds, the animals and the humans. And looking back over that creation, God said these words, this is very good. God created the world and all within it as something precious and to be valued. And he handed this on to us as human beings, as stewards of his creation, those who are called to watch over and to protect that creation and to look after and to live alongside those who are part of that living world. The Old Testament goes on to outline to us what God asks of us in response to his creation. The prophet Amos in chapter 5 says, Seek good and not evil, so that you may survive. Hate evil, love good, let justice reign at the city gate. It may be that Yahweh, God Sabbath, will take pity on the remnant of Joseph. I hate, I scorn your festivals, I take no pleasure in your solemn assemblies. Spare me the din of your chanting, let me hear none of your strumming and lyres, but let justice flow like water, and uprightness like a never failing stream. In the prophet Micah, it outlines succinctly what God asks of us. In Micah chapter 6, it says, you have already been told what is right and what Yahweh wants of you, only this, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Perhaps the most iconic passage of scripture revealing to us the values of the kingdom and Catholic social teaching is the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter five of Matthew's gospel, it says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went on to the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and this is what he taught them. How blessed are the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the gentle, they shall have the earth as inheritance. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, they shall have mercy shown them. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be recognized as children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted in the cause of righteousness, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when people abuse you and persecute you and speak all kinds of calumny against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. This is how they persecuted the prophets before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, what can make it salty again? It is good for nothing and can only be thrown out to be trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp to put it under a tub. They put it on the lampstand where it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine in people's sight, so that seeing your good works, they may give praise to your Father in heaven. At the heart of the Christian calling to social action is an understanding that we participate in the calling of Christ himself. In a wonderful passage in Luke's Gospel, Jesus speaks 
about the mission to bring the good news to the poor. It says, Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as he usually did. He stood up to read, and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a year of favour from the Lord. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant and sat down, and all eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to speak to them, saying, This text is being fulfilled today, even while you are listening. In a final passage from St. Paul's letter to Philemon, we see the consequence of living out the Christian vision of the kingdom. St. Paul presents to Philemon Onesimus, a slave whom he's been working with, and sends Onesimus back into that community, no longer as a slave, but as a brother in faith. St. Paul says, I suppose you have been deprived of Onesimus for a time, merely so that you could have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but something much better than a slave, a dear brother. At the heart of Catholic social teaching, we recognise in each other that we are brothers and sisters in faith. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that having listened to that uh, series of citations and lines from the Old and New Testament, we can gain a stronger sense of the fact that through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, its Gospels and letters, faith cashes itself, makes itself real in pursuing justice, in promoting what we call nowadays good governance of society, in right living. Faith and all of these things are interconnected. We can't be believers unless we act justly and unless we have concern for the neighbour, particularly the neighbour who is needy, and concern for care of creation. Faith, justice, care of creation, they all go together and they're interconnected. The Word of God tells us justice follows faith. Faith leads to and creates the conditions for justice. A sense of God involves care and respect for others, for creation and for society. So that closes part one. We're now going to move to the second part of our workshop and there we're going to look at the development of the social thinking and social teaching of the church. Two introductory comments. First of all, in the Acts of the Apostles, which follows the Gospel according to Luke in the New Testament, you will remember that there is a phrase which says that the early Christians, the first Christians, held everything they had in common, and they looked after the needy, especially the widows. There were issues. Some of them felt left out a wee bit, and they decided to create deacons, so that deacons could be persons who activated care and charity. The second comment. Already in the early 3rd century, a letter was written, the letter to Diophetus. It was discovered, luckily, in a fishing basket in Istanbul, they say. And in it, it said that Christians are citizens of two republics. They have a foot in two different systems. One foot in the kingdom of God, inspired by the gospel, and the other foot firmly on this earth, in the crucible, and in the mixed reality of human life. That letter says that Christians respond, of course, to the civil law. They obey it, as long as it's good, of course, but that they respond to a higher calling, a higher law, the law of the kingdom of God. That's always the challenge for the Christian. And the third thing is a guy called Tertullian, a famous Christian writer. He in a text that he wrote says, these Christians are known and recognized by the love they have for each other 
and for all people. These Christians are known by their love. We're going to look now at how some of the key themes of Christian social thinking have developed over the centuries. Moving on from the time of the scriptures, we see in the development of the history of the church that Catholic social teaching was summarized in the work of St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and then the living out of spiritual and corporal acts of mercy. One of the first writers in the history of the church around Catholic social teaching was the theologian St. Augustine of Hippo. In an important text called The City of God, he compares and contrasts the values of the kingdom of God, as revealed in, in scripture, and the values of the world. And he calls for us all as Christians to, to be missionaries of the values of the kingdom, to bring those values of the kingdom into the world of our everyday experience. Moving on from St. Augustine and looking at the life of St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, we see that St. Thomas Aquinas develops the idea of St. Augustine, this contrast between the city of God and the city of the world. And he says that the real challenge for all of us is to cooperate with the plan of God. St. Thomas Aquinas saw that the world created was a world created by God. And that God had a plan for that world. Indeed, he had written into the world around us his plan, his vision for, for all of us. He calls this the natural law. That in the world around us, we see the natural plan of God for all of creation. And he asks himself the question, how can we live a Christian life? How can we cooperate with the plan of God? And he arrives here at his theory of the virtues. St. Thomas Aquinas said that in the Christian life, there are seven key virtues that will allow a human being to flourish. He calls these the theological virtues of faith, hope and charity. And the cardinal virtues or the hinge virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude or strength and temperance. Thomas Aquinas says that if we try to live out these virtues within our lives, then we will engage with and cooperate with the plan of God for creation. This will allow us to be able to live out Catholic social teaching because first and foremost, it's about being in right relationship with God and with our brothers and sisters. So by being people of faith, by being people of hope, by being people who are charitable, by being people who are prudent and wise in judgment, people of justice and standing for, for the truth, by pe being people of fortitude, being strong in what it is that we believe in, being people who are temperate and seeking balance in life, by living out these virtues in our lives, Thomas Aquinas says that we begin to live the virtues of Catholic social teaching. In the history of the church, the traditional practice of corporal and spiritual acts of mercy were a way of enfleshing out what St. Augustine talked about as the values of the kingdom in the everyday world and St. Thomas Aquinas's living of the virtuous life. Picking up on the scriptural foundations, the corporal acts of mercy were to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to shelter the homeless, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, to visit those in prison and to bury the dead. And the spiritual acts of mercy were to instruct those who were ignorant, to engage in catechesis, to counsel those who were in doubt and to provide support for those who were in need, to admonish sin to forgive offences and to seek reconciliation and peace, to comfort those who were afflicted, to bear wrongs patiently, and to pray for the living and the dead. And these were ways of living out Catholic social teaching right through the history and life of the church.
So we come now to the third part of our workshop. And in this part, we're going to try and attempt to gain a bird's eye view, an overview of the development of the Church's social teaching in modern times. Father Eddie has spoken to you about St. Augustine, about St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas. And now we are going to move and jump to the 1800s, the 19th century. The 19th century was a time of immense and profound change for those who lived at that time. Maybe even changes greater than those we have experienced in our 21st century. It was the time first and foremost of the first industrial revolution. The invention of steam engines and before that the building of canals, horse-drawn boats, the building of the steam engine, the arrival of the railways, the possibility of crossing Europe or crossing in the United States or Latin America in trains. Mining was made more possible by the advances in engineering. With that came the growth of heavy industry and the arrival of vast numbers, massive numbers of workers into our cities. The emergence on the map, for example, of England of the black area, the black centre of England, mining and heavy industry. With the expansion of our cities came housing problems, health problems, the need for hospitals. Think of the Matter Hospital in Dublin or the Matter Hospital in Belfast, the response by the Sisters of Mercy to health needs in those cities. The plight of workers, wages, just pay, their welfare, and the slow emergence then at the end of the 19th century of the democratic society. Think of Daniel O'Connell and other leaders in other countries working for the democratization of society. In this context, a famous Pope, Pope Leo XIII, produced an encyclical called Of New Things. Now, these encyclicals uh, of modern times you'll find listed in this letter, which I wrote to students at the end of second level and the beginning of third level in 2018. And if you go to the electronic version of it, it's presented here, you will see a diagrammatic presentation of some of the great encyclicals which have been launched and issued by the popes since the end of the 1800s. The first one we look at is that of Leo XIII on the rights of workers. That was the time, remember, of Marx and those who developed the socialist thought, socialist thought and thinking. Pope Pius, Pope Leo XIII espousing the cause and the rights of workers. After that, I'll pick out another one, two other ones by Pope John XXIII. He was the man with the big ears. He became Pope in the late 1950s, and he issued two very interesting encyclicals with lovely titles on them. The first one you'll see there, The Church as Mother and Teacher. What was that about? That was about promoting human dignity, the importance of health care, of education, and of housing. Education and housing, you see, those are the themes. Then take a look at his second one called Peace on Earth. And there he touched on a theme that Pope Francis talks about an awful lot, an issue that's being threatened by many church, uh, world leaders at the moment, the importance of international institutions, international governance. Why? Because of the interdependence, the interrelatedness of the different peoples, the many different peoples of this world, that we are a human family, that nationalism, as the French president Mitterrand said, that's the way to war, turning in on yourself cooperation and institutionalized agreed ways of cooperating for the human good and benefit, the big theme of Pope John XXIII. Then we come on to his successor, Pope Paul VI. And here I presented two encyclicals that he produced, one on human progress, the progress of peoples on the development, and the other one called on the 80th year, where he talks about the importance of international cooperation and development. That's still a big theme. That was the core issue of the Synod that Pope Francis organized on the Amazon last year. The plight of the people of the Amazon, the plight of nature and of the environment there. So you see how there's a continuation in these themes. And then you come to the great Pope, Pope John, Pope Saint John Paul II. And I picked out a couple of encyclicals that he produced. One of them was on the world, on work itself on labour and work as a human capital, as a contribution to the welfare of human society. 
There he's linking back directly to the Yoda 13 uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. And then he has another one, the social concern of the church. And then he has one called the hundredth year. These are three great social encyclicals where he talks about the importance of work, the importance of human capital, and the importance of share, generating wealth to share it and distribute it in a just way. And then, of course, we come to the last, to the Pope Benedict XVI, who produced his encyclical called Charity in Truth, the importance of charity, love as a, as a, as a, as a force and a factor which inspires our social thinking, the way we organize society, the way we place value on humanity, on the products of human labor, and indeed on wealth and how we use wealth and the resources of the earth and of the cosmos. And then finally, we come to the most recent encyclical produced by Pope Francis on the environment called Laudato Si, as you know. And many of you will be very familiar with the handbook and the tools which have been produced by Trocara to help us link with Laudato Si and to exercise in many different ways care for the earth, care for vegetation, care for the oceans, care for the air and the cosmos, and of course, care for every single human life from its inception to its natural death. These are some of the great encyclicals that gives us an overview, and I suggest that in the time ahead to get to know some of these encyclicals, not all of them, some of them well, that you use this little booklet and you see even by looking at their titles the kind of issues that are central to the church's social teaching. At the very core of it is the human person created in the image of God, then the products of human energy, work, the responsibility of, of, of the human person and of society and of government for well-being in life, for the protection of life, for fostering human life, for fostering those who, countries which are still underdeveloped, sharing wealth for their development, and finally then, of course, care for and protection of the environment, Laudato Si. As we survey through the various documents of the church over the past couple of centuries, we begin to see that a number of key themes emerge within this umbrella of Catholic social teaching. Let's pick up on a number of those key themes. The first theme in Catholic social teaching is the dignity of the human person. This is the foundational principle upon which the rest of Catholic social teaching rests. As children of God created in God's image and likeness, human persons have a preeminent place in creation. Human dignity is the result of human existence. It is not earned by achievements or bestowed by any authorities other than God. It is not dependent on race, creed, colour, economic class, political power, social status, culture, personal abilities, gender, or any other dimensions by which people discriminate social groupings. There is a unique and a sacred worth that is present in each person simply because she or he exists. Human dignity, therefore, is something that cannot be taken away. Catholic social teaching believes that human beings created in the image and likeness of God, as outlined in Genesis 1, 26-27, have by their very existence an inherent value, worth and distinction. God is present in every human person, regardless of religion, culture, nationality, orientation or economic standing. Each one of us is unique and beautiful. We're called to treat each person and every creature, therefore, with loving respect. The principle of human dignity means that Catholic social teaching takes a very strong position 
on issues around the start and the end of life, like the death penalty and abortion. But it also has big consequences for everything in between. For example, it can affect how we think about how our society supports those with disabilities, how we address global inequality, and the approach we take towards civil rights and other issues of justice. The second key theme running through Catholic social teaching is the principle of solidarity, to stand alongside our brothers and sisters. Here we respond to the call of Christ himself, who in Matthew 25 said, In so far as you did this to the least of one of my brothers and sisters, you did this unto me. We all belong to one human family. As such, we have mutual obligations to promote the rights and the development of all people across communities, nations and the world, irrespective of national boundaries. In particular, the rich nations have responsibility toward the poorer nations, and people with wealth and resources are linked in God's plan with those who lack them. We stand side by side with our sisters and brothers, especially those living in poverty. Together we can make a difference and together we are much stronger. When we value human beings, we respect each other as unique individuals and we can stand up for what is right for one another. The third key theme in Catholic social teaching is the theme of community and the common good. People exist as part of a society. Every individual has a duty to share in promoting the welfare of the community and a right to benefit from that welfare. Beyond the family, we're all called to participate fully in the life of wider society. For most of us, this means an obligation to participate fully in civil society and the political and economic life of the community. This could involve involvement in movements for justice, volunteering with our local community, or active membership of trade unions. Human dignity can be recognised, developed and protected only in community with others. Each person is brother or sister to every other and can develop as a healthy human person only in a community of relationships rooted in love and justice. The foundational community for each person is his or her immediate family. The full community of each is the extended family of the whole human race through history. Each person benefits from the efforts of earlier generations and their contemporaries and are therefore under obligation to them as well. The common good means that the fruits of the earth belong to everyone. No one should be excluded from the gifts of creation. The fourth theme of Catholic social teaching is the preferential option for the poor and the vulnerable. Right from the very beginning of the church, the call to respond to those in need has been at the heart of the Christian vision. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus speaks about being given the Spirit and anointed to bring the good news to the poor and the afflicted, that he was sent to let the oppressed go free. Following in the footsteps of Christ, we too are called to respond to the needs of those who are poor and vulnerable. They are the people most often forgotten, exploited and marginalised within society. The fifth key theme of Catholic social teaching is the theme of peace and reconciliation. Peace is clearly a cornerstone of our faith. Christ, the Prince of Peace, sacrificed himself with love on the cross to bring about reconciliation between all. Peace can only come about when we learn to treat each other as brothers and sisters and to recognise our shared vocation as children of God. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, but shalom can also be translated as fullness or completeness. 
In many ways, this explains the theme of peace much better, because it isn't just an absence of war or conflict that constitutes peace, but a complete trust and fraternity between people. The sixth key theme of Catholic social teaching is the theme of dignity of work. The dignity of work has been a key principle of Catholic social teaching right from the time of 1891 when Pope Leo XIII introduced the document Rerum Novarum. In that document he shone a light on injustice and exploitation of workers by the rich during the Industrial Revolution. He advocated for workers to join forces and to fight against inhuman conditions. Since that time, church teaching has always upheld the dignity of work and participation. The human person should always come before the pursuit of profit. Workers have the right to join trade unions, to adjust wage, to spend time with their families and to rest. The final theme to pick up in Catholic social teaching is the theme that's come to prominence in more recent years, and that is the care for creation. Respect for human life means respecting all of God's creation. In the first pages of the Bible, we read how God created the sun and the stars, the water and the earth, and every living creature. And we believe that Christ is the redeemer of all creation. Pope Francis invites everyone on the planet to consider how our actions are affecting the earth and the poorest of people. Everything is interconnected and all creation praises God. It is our Christian vocation to care for creation, to live sustainably and to ensure that there are enough resources for everyone. So now that you've had an overview of the great themes in Catholic social teaching and thought, it's time in our final session, wrapping up, to look at two things, two questions. First of all, how do you keep abreast? How do we keep abreast of the development of Catholic social teaching? May I suggest two ways in which you can do that? Number one, by keeping an eye out for encyclicals uh, issued by the Pope on the great social issues and questions of our time. Remembering all this, as with Rerum Novarum, that the social teaching of the Church develops. It develops in the light of the issues confronting society, confronting the human family, and confronting the world. Second thing, you can do something on every New Year's Day. You can read the Pope's World Peace Day message. It's always fairly short, you can read it, and you can discuss it with some of your friends. So there's two follow-ups. An eye for the encyclicals and report on them, and secondly, actually reading the text of the World Peace Day message. Beyond that, how to put this teaching into action? May I suggest, along with Father William McGee, who led you through the themes that we might think of uh, this along three lines. First of all, where you live in your parish, in your local community. There are people, there are always needs and new needs. Together with some of your friends, you can every now and again run and check on what the needs of the people are. In this COVID-19 time, there are many people who are housebound, who are shielding, who are living alone, who may have been bereaved, who may need shopping done, they may appreciate either a phone call or somebody coming to their window, exercising social distancing, to talk to them. You could organise a group of people to do that. That's at parish and community level. You might even together with some others, ask the local priest if he needs any help, particularly with IT platforms as a way of communicating and evangelising, imagining novenas and prayer services that might be made available via IT platforms such as webcam or whatever to those who are living alone in their homes and indeed to families living in their homes. At the national level, it's very important that at the national and regional level that we take an interest as Christians in the issues facing our politicians. We are Christians who are citizens. We are citizens who are Christians. We have a responsibility to vote. We have a responsibility to become aware of the issues facing society in their complexity and to develop and foster a culture 
where people of very different and even opposed mentalities and viewpoints learn to listen to each other, to hear each other, to engage in respectful debate rather than in mutual illusion or deafness. Then, at the international level, what can you and I do? Sometimes that level seems so far away, unreachable, an arena we can't even influence. But just think of it, through Peru, through the interest and support that you and I take in it, is able to help people in deepest Zimbabwe or in deepest Honduras, where there is great, great poverty. I just mentioned those two countries as mere examples. But to keep abreast of the work of Trokura, to assist Trokura and such like charitable organisations, are missionaries. One group that needs an awful lot of help are the apostolic workers. They have become a generation of old people, elderly people, who um, many years ago produced vestments, supported our missionaries. They support our missionaries clerical, religious and lay in many different ways. I met a sister in deepest Africa a number of years ago and she asked me where I was from and I said I was from Dan and Connor. She looked at me and said, here in the northeast of Zimbabwe, Dan and Connor has kept our diocese and our parish turning over. It has given us immense support. That could be said of any diocese in Ireland. But the apostolic workers, are in urgent need of new and young blood. Trokura is in need of ambassadors. All of these things we can do, and by doing these, we keep the social teaching and thought of the church alive, and we enable it to reach into, to mould and transform our individual and our community consciousness and awareness, the needs of humanity, and the capacity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel, to enrich and to develop and to facilitate, as Pope Paul VI called it, the development of peoples and thereby consolidate justice and peace in our world. I salute you all. I ask you to pray for me, for Father Eddie, for Marla Mekatir and everybody who supports you in Youth 2000 and pray that our church in Ireland, as part of the Universal Church, may continue to give vibrant witness to the beauty of the social teaching of the church. God bless you all.